that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in the blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Verse 14. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. We have here a clear description of the returning Christ. When He's coming to have a literal, physical rule upon this earth. Uh, We know that there will be a tribulation period. Whether that be... Uh, whether the rapture happened, the taking out of the saints before that, or just inside of that or after that, there may be debate, but we know there will be a tribulation coming upon this earth that perhaps we're even nearing that time now when a man of sin called the Antichrist who exalts himself against God will try to implement the devil's system on this world. And at the end of that time, somewhere at the end of that time, Christ is going to say enough, and He's going to physically return to reign and rule upon this earth. This is what we know from Scripture. And what I want you to notice from this passage, there there may be several things. First of all, it says that His name is the Word of God. Everybody say the Word of God. Second of all, it says that out of His mouth proceeds a sword. Some versions will say a double-edged sword. Where does the sword come out of? Out of his mouth. And then if you go a little further, it says that that, uh, on him is written a name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So before we go any further into the authority given to the believer by Christ, we have to understand that not everything is metaphoric or mystical or simply uh, uh, well... I don't know, high thoughts or whatever you want to say, but there are some things that are actual, concrete, physical occurrences where heaven is going to invade earth. And, there's, and this is one of them. There's going to be a, a literal, physical reign of Jesus Christ on this earth when he, when he returns. And it says that on His name is written the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, what I want you to begin thinking about differently is that that is not just king of the kings of this earth and the lords of this earth like the presidents or the dignitaries, though certainly they will have His rule imposed upon them as the ruler, the physical ruler of this earth, but it is also talking about you and me. That He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the big K king and we're the little K king. He's the big L lord and we're the little L lord. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is our King and He is our Lord. And through faith in His name and through faith in who He is, He has so exalted us in the kingdom of God that we have incredible authority that we seldom touch. Now, I know that we want to exalt Jesus and not ourselves, but this is talking about Jesus exalting us. This isn't something that we made up or whipped up or came up with on our own. Some kind of magic trick. This is a real authority that has been given to us through the person of Jesus. That He's the King of kings who is us. And He's the Lord of the lords who are us. Now we're not God and we're never going to be God. But God has given us authority through Jesus and in Jesus that is just slightly below His own. What are you talking about, preacher? Well, let me show you several other places in Scripture. Because as was well said earlier, you don't make doctrine out of just one passage, right? So let me just proceed to show you a few. And, you know, in the few minutes that we have, I can't get to a lot of them, but let me show you a little bit. Alright? Because there's a book full of them. Alright. Hebrews chapter 
2, starting in verse 5. For He has not put the world to come for which we speak in subjection to the angels. But one testified in a certain place saying, now stop there because we won't have time to get there, but if you want to get there, this is a direct quote from Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. So it's another place that occurs in Scripture if you want to know where that's at. Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. Now, let's see what it says about the world being put in subjection. Okay? What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? This is talking about man. This is talking about people, about men, about women, about flesh and blood. Verse number 7, you have made him. You'll notice in your Bible that that is not a capital H. That is a small h. That is talking about you and me in Christ, if we're in Christ, believers. You have made him a little lower than the angels. Now, that's a terrible translation because the actual word is Elohim. And I think it sounds good to be a little bit lower than the angels, but Elohim is one of the names of God. And it says that He has made us to occupy a position a little bit lower than Elohim. Now, we're not God. We're never going to be God. We're never going to exert authority over God because He's God, right? This is not a self-delegated authority. This is an authority that the King of kings and Lord of lords has given to us. In Him. Verse 7 again, You have made Him, that's us, a little lower than the angels. You have crowned Him with glory and honor, and you have set Him over the works of your hand. You have put all things in subjection under His feet. Now, that's talking about us, and they're going to apply it to Jesus, but you're going to see how it comes back full circle. For in that He, that now we're getting into the capitals. Do you see how we're getting capital all of a sudden? For in that He put all in subjection under Him, He left nothing that is not put under Him, but now we do not yet see all things put under Him. Alright, now you got to work with me a little bit here. We're going to very quickly try to teach through this. We are seeing, if you watch your, your words there, we're going back and forth to capitals to little letters. We're talking about God some places, we're talking about man some places. Now this next verse that we get into, you're going to see that it's talking about Jesus. Very clearly talking about Jesus. But here, it's talking about us. Because we don't see everything put under us yet. We don't see everything put under us. Now the authority is very real, and it is very much there, but we don't see the manifestation of everything put under us yet. Now, we can, by faith, if we work the Word and believe God, see all things under us because we're under Him, but we don't see the full manifestation of it yet. Uh, probably if I stand outside my house and say gold streets, gold streets, gold streets, they're probably not turning gold like they are in heaven yet. Work with me here. Go on to the next verse. Verse number 9. But we see Jesus. See, there's a transition. We, everything is put under His feet already. But we don't see everything under... We don't see the full manifestation of our authority in Him yet. But we see the full manifestation of His authority. Let's go back up to verse, the last part of verse 8 and read it as a unit. It says, For in that He put all in subjection under Him... He left nothing that is not put under Him. But now we do not yet see all things put under Him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So, what the writer of Hebrews is telling us here is that in Christ, we yield an incredible amount of authority we yield an authority that is just a little bit lower than God Himself. Now, we don't see the full manifestation of that yet because we're told in other places uh, that, that when I was a child, I walked like a child and I thought like a child, but when I became a man, I put my childish ways behind me. And if you read on in that Romans passage, then it'll say that there's coming a day when we see Him and we'll be made like Him. So we, you know, but now we see darkly, like through a glass darkly. So we don't see the full manifestation of that authority yet in us, 
But clearly the passage says that in Him, we can see the manifestation of it. Because and all authority has already been given to Christ, but we just don't see the full manifestation of it yet in our lives. Alright, so now, let me go to another passage to show you that Pastor Dave just don't make this stuff up. And we're going to tap into the grace to get there in the amount of time that we have, and we'll get there. Alright, Romans chapter 5, verse 17. We will come back to this verse when we get back into the Romans study, but let's go to Romans 5.17 very quickly. For if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, that through Adam's offense, through Adam's sin, that death reigned on the earth through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life. Through the One, Jesus Christ. So, before the fall of man, man was endued with great authority over the earth. We don't have time to go back and develop all that, but you ought to know it by now, that God gave man dominion over the earth. He said to subdue it. To take authority over the animals and the the, uh, nature and all the things involved in the earth. The substances of the earth. Adam, when he sinned, yielded that authority to the devil through sin. And all of a sudden, childbearing became painful. Briars came up and you had to work the ground to grow things. And man had lost his authority. In Christ Jesus, that authority was restored to us as a believer. Now, we don't just naturally see the full manifestation of that yet. We will. when You know, that that's our part of our blessed hope that when He appears or when we go to be with Him in heaven, that we're going to see the full manifestation of that. But I propose to you today that God wants us to be walking in a whole lot more authority in our life because the authority has already been given to us. We just haven't grown up in that or developed in that authority. And He wants us to be walking in a lot more authority within our life. Because this passage here, Romans 5.17, doesn't say that we'll just reign in death. It doesn't say we'll reign when we get to heaven. It says that those who have received the abundance of grace and righteousness in Him will reign where? In life. Now here's what I want you to get. And believe me, I could keep you here for hours giving you Scriptures because there's a book full of them to support this. Since we've been reckoned righteous and our dominion has been restored over the earth, but now what I want you to understand is that in Jesus... Our dominion has been restored over the earth, but that's just the low-level things. Our dominion has been restored. God has has added to the original dominion, and the redeemed man has great dominion over the entire existence, spiritual things and physical things. Now, we're not God, and we're never going to be God, but He's given us His authority. The Scripture is full of illustrations that illustrate this. They're not there just to be good children's stories. They're not there just to be something good to read in Sunday school. But the Old Testament, we're told, is put there as a foreshadowing of the things that would come. And we have all kinds of illustrations. We can talk about Joseph. How uh, he rose out of his impoverished condition to become second most powerful person in Egypt. Now, Joseph wasn't the Pharaoh, was he? But Joseph yielded the power of the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh said, go anywhere that you want to go in the kingdom. Do whatever you want to do in the kingdom in my name. And he yielded, he wasn't the Pharaoh, but he yielded the full force and full authority of the Pharaoh. We have other examples. We have uh, the uh, example of Moses before, before Moses left Egypt. See, Moses was already great in Egypt before he uh, killed the slave. And if you read the account, it says that Moses thought everyone would understand it and they would follow him. He just thought everyone would understand that God had put him in that position to be the deliverer of his people. The people didn't realize it, and Moses still had some growing up to do. And if you think we got growing up to do, Moses had 50 years in the desert after 50 years in Egypt. So he was about 100 years old before he started getting grown up enough to do it. But, but Moses wasn't the Pharaoh, but Moses walked in great authority within the land of Egypt. The authority was delegated. We got the example of Daniel. Both the authority of God he walked in, but also the authority of Babylon that he walked in. Daniel walked in authority under three kings, I believe it was. 
And he was, he was always either the second most powerful person or the third most powerful person or one of the top people in the land of Babylon. These were the most powerful nations in the world in their day. Now those things aren't there just to be good Bible stories. Those things are there to be an example for us. Uh, we got the kings of Israel who are an example for us. The great exploits of David and of Solomon who as they walked with God and they feared God, they did incredible things. I mean, that David, he did incredible things. Some of them we don't even talk about. One day, when David, when God said to David, He said, you can't build the temple because your hands are stained with blood, but I'll let your son build the temple and I'll let you get things ready for it. You know, David got so excited that he gave what would be equivalent to several billion dollars of our money today. David was a no pulper. If God can give it through you, God will give it to you. See, these are given as an example for us. Solomon, when he walked with God before, before he fell away from God for a season, but when he walked with God, the borders of Israel stretched, stretched way out beyond where they had been previously into foreign lands. And the influence of Solomon stretched around the world. People would come just to hear the wisdom of Solomon when he spoke. These weren't just good children's stories. These things are given to us as an illustration for us of the authority that if we'll position ourselves in Christ and under Christ, the authority that comes into the life of the believer. We could go many other places in Scripture. We can see that when Jesus sent out the twelve and when He sent out the twenty, or the twelve and then the seventy-two, how it says that He gave them authority over the demonic forces, authority over the sickness and over the disease. In Christ, our authority has been restored and the bounds of that authority have been expanded. We're intended to reign in this life. It doesn't mean that we're not going to face difficulty or struggles. It doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean that we'll see the complete manifestation of heaven on earth. But that is the ideal. That is the, the place that we're pushing towards and looking towards. And if we learn to walk in the authority of God, we'll see a whole lot more happen. Because the Word says that He'll do exceedingly abundantly beyond what you can ask or think. But we have to learn to walk in the authority. The primary way that we walk in the authority that God has vested in us is through the power of the tongue. Uh, now, that, that power is based in a personal faith and in a trust in God. It's not just empty words. As the believer's heart is right and trusting in God and full of the Word of God, then our tongue can begin to speak in power. Now, this isn't just Mystical power, again, this is real power that can really do stuff. That can bring real change. Now, we talk a lot about taming the tongue and controlling the tongue. And that's a whole uh, good part of this discussion. The Word has a lot to say about that. But I want you to understand today that the power of decree and the power in the tongue is much more than just keeping yourself from losing your temper or just simply keeping yourself from saying bad things. But there's real power given to us, real authority that we can speak and with the power of our tongue, we can create, we can dictate, we can exert influence and authority. Let me show you some of that real quickly. I didn't get there, but if you want more verses, Hebrews 12.28 tells us we're receiving a kingdom. That's in the present tense. We're in the process of receiving it. Revelations 1, 5, and 6 says that He's made us a kingdom of kings and priests under the Lord our God. See, this stuff's too good to make up. It's all through the book. Just because we've perhaps neglected the exercising of it, it doesn't mean it's not the Word of God. We have great authority and we're to exercise that with, with the power of the tongue. All right. So we know that this authority is kingdom authority and it's in and under Christ. Uh, so go over to uh, Acts chapter 3. I guess we're doing this more like a teaching today. I thought it was going to be fire and brimstone today. See that? And the Lord's having teaching instead. That's okay. We submit, Lord. Okay, Acts 3.16. Because sometimes it's new thoughts. And it takes a while to digest new thoughts. Acts 3.16 After the apostles had healed this man by the temple, 
and it was a, a great occurrence, and many people came to the Lord and were excited and were amazed by this. Peter says this in verse 16. He says, And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. The faith that comes through him. Our words, when it's linked into the faith that comes through him, has the power to heal the lame. It has the power to heal the crippled. It has the power to uh, uh, set the captive free, to bring deliverance to the oppressed and the depressed and the possessed and whatever else there is. Because we have been given authority. And when we speak, we're not speaking empty words. It's not just the sermon that a preacher dreamed up. But with the soul that is vitally linked and abiding in God, there is a real faith and a real authority that has real power to move mountains. Real power to change situations. Real. This is real stuff. The authority given to the believer. Loosed through our words. Well, go on to verse number 12. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which men may be saved. That's actually chapter 4, verse 12. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. There's a delegated authority, a real authority that comes into our life through a childlike faith in Jesus. That we simply, you know, we don't know how all the, the pieces fit together, but we simply believe the Word of God. We simply... Uh, are linked with Jesus, and we speak and we decree and we exercise authority within this earth. When I was over the five group homes, one night I was mopping the floors. Well, I wasn't over them yet. I was working overnight shifts, and I had a mop bucket, and I was out there in the overnight shift in the middle of the night mopping the floors, just like anyone else in the place. The next day I got a phone call. One of the muckety mucks said, Dave, I think the lady doing this position is going to leave. But he said, she's basically going. And I want to get rid of her quick. So he, said, he told me, he said, she's going no matter what you decide anyway. He said, I want to go ahead and get rid of her quick. So would you take this position? Because we can move on. I said, okay, yeah, I'll take the position. And one night I was on the overnight shift mopping floors. The next time I came in, I was a big cheese. It's amazing how different people treated me. Now, you don't let it go to your head because I'd still mop the floors with them. That was probably part of my problem. I'd still do that, that stuff. And that was a, a bit of an Ishmael, but I learned a lot during that time. There's a real authority that God has given us, just like that. And a lot of us, it's great to be a servant. Hallelujah, be a servant. God wants us to be servants. But don't ever forget, we're servant sons. Amen. We're also sons of God. We're also the friends of God. And I'll tell you what, you don't need to walk around like the lowly... The devil wants to keep you like that little janitor mopping the floor in the middle of the night. Woe is me. When God's saying, hey son, I'm ready to do something here. You ready to step up into the authority? And I'll tell you what, there's no limits with God. I mean, we don't understand. Only God and you know the faith that's locked up within you. Now, we're, I know we're running out of time quickly here, but I want you to get this illustration. Don't, you know, don't label people just because of a, a word. We, we, helped, we assisted in planting a Word of Faith church before coming here, and I love the Word of Faith. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't agree with everything in Word of Faith, but you can understand that because you don't agree with everything that calls itself Pentecostal, do you? You know what? If you did, then all you women are out of the will of God today. You don't got your hair in a bun. You don't got the dark dress on. And some of you are even wearing makeup. But we love Pentecost because Pentecost is real. And Pentecost is the Word of God, right? Pentecost is a great experience for believers. So don't get all wrapped up in this stuff. Oh, Word of Faith. No, there's a lot of great Word of Faith. Oh, I'll tell you, we could learn so much from our brothers and sisters in the Word of Faith. 
Now, just because it's labeled Word of Faith don't mean I believe it. But if it's in the Word, you take it. And there was a day, Delany could tell you this, there was a day years back, God, and God has such a sense of humor, I, when someone told me, well, that Word of Faith stuff not in the Bible, and I just was not smart enough to look it up and find out for myself, and I just believed them. And at least for a couple years, I had a bad attitude about something I didn't even know about. And then one day, let's go ahead and go over there, because it's right along what we're... Holy Ghost is telling us this morning. Go to Romans chapter 10. Hallelujah. It'll take me a minute to get there, but we're in Romans chapter 10. I'll tell you the verse in a second. I think it's 8. Yes, Romans chapter 8. One day I was just minding my business, reading my Bible like I ought to be doing, and I came across this. Romans chapter 10, verse 8. But what does it say? The Word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the Word of faith which we preach. And I said, oh Lord, forgive me. And I had a little repentance time with Jesus. And then God has a sense of humor because I ended up helping plant two Word of Faith churches. After not, not believing in what I didn't know I didn't believe in. Uh, but you don't, don't just get these foolish ideas just because something's different than what you've ever heard it before. It don't mean it's not true. Receive, look into the Word. See what the Word says. And now this goes right along with what we're talking about because this is the Word of faith that we preach. That it's in our heart and it's in our mouth. The authority that God has given us is vested in us, but it must be released through our mouth. And we can rule as kings and priests we can reign in this life if we'll get our believing and our talking right. But we say so many sometimes negative things, unbelieving things, even when we're kidding and joking. And I don't know about you, but I always get under conviction for that. So I'm asking God just to go ahead and help me get it right so I don't have to keep repenting over it. Because God, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Isn't that what it says? So when we walk around talking about how sick and dying and terrible. You're speaking out of your heart. I'm sorry, but you are. Well, let's get the the authority and the belief and the knowing in the heart so that we can speak life-giving words of power. And it don't matter what my body says. This body is coming into subjection of the authority vested in me in the name of Jesus Christ. And this body is healthy, wealthy, and wise. Amen? That's the word of faith that we preach. That, that's the word of God. Now, I want you to think of it like this. Sometimes we think that we can just speak empty words and as if that has to come to pass. That's not the case. But realize, oh Lord, help me. We don't got time to get there, but I'll submit to you, Lord. Okay, uh, if you went to Luke chapter 4, you can do this on your own. After Jesus was filled with the Spirit and He went into the desert to be tempted, and it says the devil came and he tempted him in various different ways. You know the story I'm talking about, right? Well, one of those ways, the devil said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And Jesus said, no, it hasn't. Because first of all, there was no authority given to the devil. Everything he had was taken, stolen. It wasn't given, it was taken. It was stolen. Adam gave it, but it was stolen from Adam. Now, I don't know if you remember, but years back, I remember as a kid, there was this commercial on TV where the two boys were having an argument, and the one boy said, I'll wrestle you for it. Remember that? You maybe don't remember that commercial. They said, I'll wrestle you for it, and then the two kids started wrestling, and it was about like not beating each other up, but getting along was what the commercial was about. But Jesus didn't say to the devil, I'll wrestle you for the authority. No, what did he do? He rebuked the devil with the word. Now understand that Jesus had been filled with the Spirit. And Jesus was full of the word. Now here's the illustration that I want you to get. The word of faith, the real word of faith that we believe and we preach, that yields authority upon the earth is like this. It's like a bullet. Like you're the shell and the Holy Ghost is the gunpowder and the word of God is the lead. Now that's some power. When you get it right, you're loaded for bear. <laughs> Devil, you want to come against me with unbelief? Go ahead and try, because I am loaded for demons. I am loaded for the dragons. And Jesus, he did, well, what will I do? And, and oh, Father, remember I emptied myself of my divine privileges, and, and what am I going to do? And the devil, no, he didn't do that. What Jesus did was he stood up and said, he, said he was full of the Spirit, 
And he spoke the word. And just like a shotgun loaded for bear, he took that devil out. Because this is the word of faith we preach. And so what, what I'm telling you is you don't have to do this on your own. You're like the shell, but you've got to be full of the Spirit and full of the Word. And then you speak that stuff, and it takes out the enemy. And it doesn't just take out the enemy, but it has real creative power. Uh, we've been there before, but very quickly. I'm under my five minutes of grace now. So, so very quickly, we, we're grace people. So Genesis 1-2, you know this verse. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. Now, if you go up, and we won't do it today, but if you go up to John chapter 1, you'll see that Jesus is the Word, as we've been talking about, and that all things were made by Him and in Him and that the Word was there in the beginning. So even God, when He speaks in faith and in power, has the Spirit and the Word. That's God's loaded gun. And I'm telling you, the enemy may come in, but like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him if you're loaded. Well, Peggy, last Sunday night, I think it was you that shared that story about the bird dog and the dynamite. Was that you? And uh, for those of you that weren't, weren't here, there were these idiots that were ice fishing and they threw a stick of dynamite. And their, their bird dog ran out and got it and was running it back to them. And so they started shooting it with bird shot because it wouldn't kill the dog. But it just made the dog more excited and it ran back to them quicker and blew up their, their uh, SUV or whatever it was. So, uh, you know, but we're trying to shoot the devil with bird shot sometimes. And we wonder why we keep getting blowed up. Hey, there's, no, there's nothing but death and destruction and stupidity in the devil. We don't need anything He's got for us. And through the power of the Spirit, we can mortify these misdeeds of the flesh. But we got to get loaded for this stuff. we got to get in the Word. we got to get loaded for the battle that we're, we're facing some, of a, some people daily in their lives. If you're full of the Word, and if you're full of the Spirit, you've already got the authority given to you and delegated to you, then you can begin to speak in faith and change things, and turn things around. Uh, praise God. Amen? I like what uh, uh, Margaret said about the Word of the Lord, how there's been visitors every week. That wasn't the Word of man, that was the Word of the Lord. And you confess that Word. If a week, if there's no visitor, you just say, Lord, you're, you promised us a prophetic Word that said we would have visitors. Now, but now, here's where the Word of faith wants to take us. We don't want just visitors. We want to increase, increase, increase. And that's what God wants in our life. He's a God of increase. Well, let's stand. I know that somehow the Lord's going to help you carry a sack full of these thoughts home. And He's going to get you under the Holy Ghost conviction and make you think about how you speak and how you act. That's what He does for me. But Lord... If you receive the word, just lift your hands towards heaven. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right there to be taken hold of by force. Lord, we confess to you. I, do. I, confess. I speak on our behalf, but if you agree, you just say amen at the end. Lord, I confess to you empty and vain words. Not necessarily dirty words, though if those are there too, we confess them. But just empty words, unbelieving words. And Lord, we ask You to fill us with Your Word and with the power of Your Spirit that we could speak true words of faith. Words of faith that will bring salvation to people. Words of faith that will bring financial release, just like You did. Words that will bring healing, just like You spoke. Words that will change our attitudes. And even so much more than an attitude. Lord, a real releasing with our tongues of the authority that You've put within us. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, Amen.